All right, guys, today I have a special guest. His name is Michelle Falcon. He's an entrepreneur, advisor, author, and international keynote speaker who leverages customer experience, employee engagement, and company culture strategies to grow businesses. As an entrepreneur, Michelle has grown a hospitality company with over 100 employees and tens of millions in yearly revenue. Plus, I really want to talk about his new book, you know, People First, over here, fantastic book, read it last night. Michelle, welcome to the show, brother. What's up, man? Thank you for having me. Hey, man. Thanks for coming quite, down. Quite the setup here, man. This is pro. I know. Yeah, you got to thank the team here behind. Thank you, team. You know, this is this is legit. It's legit. I could stay here for a bit. No doubt, man. Let's chop it up. I got time. All right, cool. First question. Why this? I, in 2018, um, was asked a question when I was keynote speaking from an audience member, and uh, the gentleman asked me, why is it so many companies talk about delivering great experiences to customers and employees, but so few companies actually do it? Mm. I was like, wow, that's a loaded question. Not one that I can't answer. I was like, how much time do you have? Uh, so I gave him the short version and he liked the answer. It seemed like the audience was vibing with the answer as well too. And then it got me thinking, I was like, I could probably expand uh, on this in and make it into a book. Uh, a book is something I'd always wanted to write, but I'm not um, a literary genius by any we means. Uh, it takes a lot of effort for me to write. Um, but I knew that there was a book based on that question that gentleman asked me. Uh, I linked up with um, a company called Scribe Media. Mm -hmm. They helped me write the book. And I wanted to answer that question in depth. Why is it that most companies fall short of being admired by customers and employees and doing good by them uh, while also maintaining a healthy bottom line? And why do some succeed? So um, I worked with Scribe Media, put the book together, um, took several months, uh, but uh, they were able to get it out of me. And so far the response has been really solid. Um, I'm happy with it and you know truth be told like I don't make a lot of money from the book um, unless you're like a Simon Sinek type mm. author you're not really making money off the book um, for me it was not to sound too fluffy but like kind of a proud moment first person in my family to write a book actually part of me second person my grandfather wrote a book um, not related to business at all. Um, there was that, made my mom happy. Um, serves as uh, a great business card. Uh, it allows me to speak like all over the world. Um, so that's kind of how the book came together, why it came together. Um, and, you know, still pushing it, happy with the message and it seems like audiences like it. Why don't we kind of rewind back and tell the audience what was the process you did? Because I know a lot of it, a lot of this in your book over here is from the experience mm -hmm. of your life. What was the process and maybe key points you can talk about that you learned or key things you learned in, in your in your experience of building your company? Yeah. Um, like in 2020 hindsight, looking back. There's a lot of things. Uh, I'll narrow in on a few uh, that I think listeners might jive with mm. or might be surprising to them. Um, I think there are three key reasons why a company will fully commit to building a company that's admired by customers, employees, and communities, and why um, some don't deliver great experiences to anybody. Yeah. And it, it really boils down to the leadership of the organization. And those three reasons are one, where do you go to learn about how to build these type of companies? Business school isn't teaching it well based on my experience in uh, understanding the curriculum mm -hmm. in traditional business school. Um, company culture, employee experience, customer experience are relatively new topics, right? This isn't PR or digital marketing, right? So there's an absence of education that 
companies are going to need to overcome and find that education. The second reason why uh, a leader might not be able to build this type of company is because of short-term and long-term thinking. If you're going to build a company that delivers great experiences to people, you can't be asking yourself, what is the ROI of me doing this? Yeah. Right? Like, you know, the best analogy that I can use and I share it in the book is if I had my mother fly in to Toronto from Vancouver and I'm driving down the highway going to pick her up at Pearson Airport in Toronto, do you think I would be asking myself, what is the ROI of doing this? You know, like, how much gas is this costing? Like, that would be psychotic. But why is it that we still ask those questions when building systems or processes or delivering experiences to anybody that interacts with our brand? Mm -hmm. Often when we invest in something, we're thinking on the short term because we've been trained to do so. Um, when you buy Facebook ads, that ROI could show up the very next day or PPC or whatever type of campaign that you're, you're working on. When it comes to building relationships with people, you can't be asking yourself, what is the ROI or when it's going to happen? Just do it for sake of doing it and knowing that you're going to build a great company along the way. Uh, and the third reason is having the ability to care about a stranger. Mm. Your customers, your employees, your community, at one point, they're going to be new to you. And to be able to authentically deliver a great experience and care about somebody that you don't know, it takes a certain level of DNA to be able to do, you do that. Do you have examples for us to share, like what you've done in the past in that scenario with that complete stranger? I, yeah, I do. This uh, story was going to be uh, produced, or uh, sorry, uh, the Toronto Guardian was going to write about this, but then I retracted the story because I was like, you know what, I don't actually want people to, t to really know, but you know, I'll share it with you now. Um, I got a call from our one of our head hostesses, um, Celeste, and she said, hey, Michelle, I just um, booked a reservation for a woman that is having dinner with her husband, and she's celebrating uh, his 40th birthday or something like that. I said, okay, oh, you want to do something nice for them? She's like, yeah, we're going to do something nice for them. But she shared a story with me that kind of moved me, and I think we have an opportunity to do something good. She said the story while she was booking the reservation with this woman on the phone. They started kind of going back and forth with just everyday dialogue. And the woman, I'm paraphrasing, but the woman said, you know, it's been a really tough uh, couple weeks for me and my husband. Uh, we're looking forward to hosting his party. And um, Celeste was like, what happened? or what's happening. And um, the woman said, our son is about to have like life save saving surgery mm. um, at sick kids hospital. And uh, that's been really trying for us. And, you know, hotels are so expensive. We want to stay, we live, I believe they lived in Brampton, um, which is what an hour mm -hmm. outside of Toronto and sick kids hospital, which is downtown Toronto. Hotels are really expensive and so are Airbnbs. So Celeste was like, Michelle, do you think we could pay for their hotel to stay the three days that the son is having his operation, like for that period of time? And I said, you know, in my head, I was like, that's going to really eat into our operating <laughs> budget. But I was like, you know what? Let me call you right back. And I called, I talked to Sophia, my girlfriend. I said, hey, you're the biggest enabler of my career and my crazy ideas, right? She said, I am. I said, would you mind if we stayed at your parents' house for three days? I want to welcome this stranger and her husband into our home and let them stay. Here's the story. Sophia's like, let's do it. Like Sophia, like, <laughs> just as a side note, like I said, she's the biggest enabler of my career. Anything I said, if I asked her to do, she'd be like, I'm for, I'm for it. Let's do it. Right. So I'm, I'm thankful for her. So I'd give her a little shout out there. But that's something that we did. These complete strangers stayed in our condo for three days. So Sophie and I made sure that uh, they could um, use all of our uh, kitchen supplies because the mother wanted to cook meals for uh, her son 
who was, again, just about to have this life-saving surgery, and thankfully everything worked out. But, you know, we said, hey, help yourself. Here's how to use our Netflix. Here's our Netflix login. Here's our kitchen supplies. Like, do you use, use our Tupperware? Like, um, so, you know, I would like to think that that's something special and unique about my operating ability or just who I am as a person. Forget about the, the business side of it. It's just like, look, if you called me and said, hey, homie, I need a place close to St. Lawrence Market where I live. Do you mind if I stay at your place? Hey, Sophia, do you mind? Done. Let's go. Right. So those are just some of the things that like I'm willing to do for strangers. And, you know, some people find it weird. I find it normal and I wouldn't change any, anything about that. Would you say you're always like this or this is something? Yeah. Okay. Man, if you met my parents, like I'll tell you a story. I, um, was interviewed by, um, or pardon me, I interviewed the CEO of 1-800-GOD-JUNK, okay. my former company that I worked for when I was in my early 20s. That was my MBA equivalent. Was Cameron still there when you were there? Or? Cameron's, Cameron Harold, <laughs> yeah. the COO, his last day was my very first day. Ah. And I'll tell you, let me make sure I come back to the story okay. of, of Brian Scudamore. But I remember being in the, I, my first role at the company was in the call center mm. and I, we were in a training room learning how to use the like operating system, like software and everything to book appointments. And I remember our trainer saying, Hey, everybody needs to come into the huddle room. This is where they had their kind of stand up huddles and, and meetings. Uh, we have a, like, there's a special announcement happening and, um, I go in there first day and Cameron is giving a, a speech about how this is his last day. And I had just left business school to go work for 1-800-GOT-JUNK as a call center agent, a big gamble. Like my parents were like, Michelle, what are you doing? Stay in business school. But I was like, no, trust me. I didn't need to go learn from this company. I joined this company on day one. I see the COO of the company resigning and crying. I'm like, what the hell have I done? <laughs> but it all worked out for the best. Back to the Brian Scudamore story. Um, I interviewed him and... Toward the interview, I thanked him and I said, thank you for building the company that allowed me to be successful today. And he said on camera, he said, Michelle, you have to stop thanking me for that. And he's like, the people that you should really thank are your parents because they're the people that gave you the DNA to actually do any of this. And I was like, like, that was heavy. That was a paradigm shift. I'm as soon as I got out of the building from hosting the interview with him, called mom and dad and was like, you know what? Like, thank you. Like, I don't think I've ever really thanked you for helping my career in a way that I don't even think they impacted. I didn't know that they impacted like that, but like, I just believe in building relationships with people, man. And am I going to get burned along the way? Is somebody going to take advantage of my kindness? A hundred percent. It'll probably happen next week or the week after that. And it will happen for years to come, but that's not going to change the way that I operate. Burn me if you want. Shame on you, man. What was the cat like? Well, we're going to go back even a little bit further. I like to keep on subtracting here. Out of all industries in the fucking world, <laughs> you know what I mean? Such a cliche. What was a, what was that thing that's like, fuck it, man, I'm going into this. So hospitality, it's not a, like I worked in hospitality as like a server in college. Uh, I think, you know, everybody's had kind of their like time in hospitality. In the 10th grade, my dad filed for bankruptcy. Uh, it was a very hard time um, for our family. Mm. Like, very, very hard. Like, seeing a grown man, your hero, cry, like, because of financial stress is tough. Um, and the reason he filed for bankruptcy is because um, he was on the short end of the, a bad deal. He got screwed over by somebody who thought he thought he was his friend, and it happened to be in the restaurant. Uh, my father owned a restaurant in West Vancouver. And I never imagined myself getting into hospitality. Um, in 2016, my friend Brandon, um, who's my partner today, uh, called me. Um, I was living in Vancouver at the time, and he said, hey, you, you know, we had always wanted to work together. And he said, come and help us uh, build this huge venue, like four floors, 16,000 square feet, tens of thousands of customers, 100 employees from day one, tens of you know, over $10 million a year in sales uh, is what we're projecting for year one. I was like, wow, this sounds like a challenge. Mm. I thought I was only going to 
quote unquote moved to Toronto for three months. Three months turned into six months. Six months turned into I guess I live in Toronto now because they were like, do you want to be a partner? Um, and since then we had opened another venue as well too, which is challenging as well. Um, I never set out to come into this industry, but once I mm. started kind of sticking my nose in it and, and looking around is like, there's a lot that has been done incorrectly that could be fixed. A lot of people were like back home in Vancouver, like you're going to get into restaurants. Like what the hell? Like, well, you, you mentioned something here. A lot of things are being done incorrectly. Interviewing. Like, yeah, well, that's one point. In the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, that's one of the topics that I love talking about. Like a lot of companies are like very transactional with the way that they interview. I like to take the approach of to interviewing as you would like, who are you going to maybe marry one day? Who's going to be uh, a friend of yours that you're going to invite into a wedding or who's going to come to your, your birthday party. Mm. You're not just going to invite anybody. Right. And you have to be selective. You have to have a criteria or like when, uh, you know, a woman is deciding who is she, what type of man does she want to marry? You know, tall, nice teeth. Like thankfully Sophia doesn't care about either of those things, but, um, <laughs> but like, you know, there's a criteria. Sure. Why can't we have that same criteria when it comes to hiring? Like what, uh, you know, with no disrespect to my partners, um, you know, the way that they were hiring is very transactional and just kind of very like lackadaisical, if you will. And I was like, well, you can fix that. Mm. What about our learning and development? Like how we're wanting our team members to deliver great experiences to customers, but we're delivering them a poor training experience. No wonder that they're not succeeding. We haven't set them up for success. Um, so it was it was challenging. It was very challenging. And that's what makes, helps me thrive as a professional is being faced with a big challenge and being like, okay, what tools do I have to overcome these challenges? So that's how I, how I got into hospitality. I, I never dreamt about it. I never had a, a, a long tenure in hospitality. It was just like, Hey, you want to do this? I said, sure, let's do it. <laughs> and here I am today. Interesting. Kind of similar to how uh, Toby from Shopify fell into his I listened gig. to the How I Built This yeah, Podcast. That was a great, one, a great that episode. Was, yeah. I've listened to it three times. Yeah, I, really I have good. this habit with listening to podcasts like multiple times because I like to listen to it once and then I like to dissect it mm. like every like 15 minute increment and like kind of study what they've said. But to your point, that was a awesome podcast. He's actually somebody that I, I don't know him personally, but just the way he carries himself. Yes. Right? Just unassuming, just... Humble, man. Yeah. Really fucking humble. Hell yeah, man. Just accent adds to it as well, yeah, too. Yeah. Like the likability. Yeah, the German yeah. accent gets me. Right. Yeah. I really enjoy it. So you mentioned um, l learning or upskilling or educating your staff, employees. Yeah. How does that process look like for you guys? It's module based. Okay. So it's very labor intensive. It costs a lot of money and effort. And everybody in the whole organization is doing that. Yeah. So the the theory behind the training is, let, I'll give you a real world example. Um, we train on the three common customer personality types, something that I had created, invented, coined, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and I think that there are three common personality types. There is the director style personality, which is somebody who doesn't want chit chat. Don't talk to them about the Raptors or any sports teams. They just mean business. They know what they want when they want to keep the conversations uh, sure. short. Product knowledge matters to them. There's a socializer. That's a person that's going to talk to you about why the sky is blue, <laughs> what their dog's name is, and you need to engage them in those yeah, off-topic yeah. conversations or else you're going to feel uh, like, like you were rude if you don't. Yeah. Uh, and the third is the uh, passive. Uh, if you've ever asked somebody, how's your day going? And they respond with good and nothing else like most human beings would be mm -hmm. like, and how's your day going? That's the passive. They're guarded. They're timid a bit. You would think that that training material is reserved for hostesses, bartenders, salespeople, right? Frontline mm -hmm. individuals. But my argument is 
why shouldn't your finance team take that information and, and absorb that education as well too? Because after all, your finance team, whether it's a bookkeeper or a director or a controller, they also interact with people that touch your brand. Your investors, your bank representatives, maybe your insurance people. So any type of customer-centric or people-centric learning and education that we have, my expectation is that the entire company goes through it, everyone on payroll. Because how can you truly be an authentic brand that delivers great experiences to everyone if everyone doesn't have the same education? Going, uh, you know, building off of that, uh, training doesn't ever stop. Like learning and development doesn't stop. You know, LeBron James didn't stop practicing after he made the NBA, right? Your highest performer, Beyonce, doesn't stop her vocal training just because she's won X amount of Grammys. Um, one thing that I read, um, Howard Schultz, the former um, CEO of Starbucks, say, and I'm totally paraphrasing, um, but he said, People think Starbucks is a great marketing company, but we don't really advertise at all. What the typical company would spend on advertising, we spend on learning, development, and training, and that's our marketing. Mm. And that's the same way I want to grow our business and any business that I build from this day on forward. For a number of reasons. Uh, one, it's it just makes sense to ensure that your team members have the education to deliver great experiences, the motivation, uh, to well, do you so. guys, you guys built out your own modules for this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all my, it's, okay. it, it's all my content related to. And so is this given in real person or I'm going online and like, so today it's in person. Um, the vision for it would be a combination of in person and, and digital learning as well too. I don't, like the idea of all training being digitalized. Um, I think uh, that only serves um, a certain Small, type of learning yeah. style. I agree. Right. I yeah. like the human interaction. Especially in a human business like this. hundred percent. A hundred percent. It's such a high touch business. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't, you know, sometimes people build learning development programs and they build it for what makes sense to them. Mm. But you have to think like Amir probably learns different than Michelle does. Like Michelle needs to see somebody do something. Yeah. Right. Like I have a hard time watching YouTube videos. So I feel like just watch a YouTube video how to do that. I'm like, I can't. <laughs> right? Like I need yeah, to, yeah. I need to watch yeah, somebody. Wire differently. Yeah, totally. I am. Right. And it doesn't make me smarter or less intelligent. Mm -hmm. It's just how I want to learn. Right. Um, but it's, it, it's, it's something that I kind of marvel at when companies are like, we, you know, we believe in, employee experience and customer experience. I'm like, oh, okay, that's awesome. Well, like, how much do you spend on marketing per year? X. How much do you spend on learning and development? X minus like 75% of that, mm. right? Like, I'm like, do you though? Do you really believe in it? Because your, P and, because your budgeting tells me otherwise. Yes. So. How did your partners take that when you brought in all these new changes? Because that yeah. would have been interesting, right? Okay, Brandon, uh, my partner, was like, you know, respect to him. He gave me a clear runway mm. um, and just said, go. And he didn't just let me do anything, right? I would always collaborate with him, but, like, he he had my back. Um, my other partners, I, I, I think maybe they were cynical. Um, like... This guy has no restaurant experience. What the hell is he talking about? And I, you know, I, I was kind of like, just trust me. I know I'm a stranger to you right now, but just trust me. I wouldn't put my name next to something if I didn't feel like it was going to be successful. But I think they were a, a, a bit kind of skept skeptical at first. This is new. Change is new. Whereas your change is difficult for some people, right? Sure, of course it is. Especially when it costs money. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but I would like to believe that my partners would join me and say it was for the best and that everything worked out. And were there bumps and bruises along the way? Of course, right? 
uh, we had tremendous growth. Like in less than two years, we went from zero to fifteen million dollars a year in revenue, zero to one hundred and fifty employees. Like it was hard, man. Like before hospitality, I was doing work with like Alfa Romeo, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Verizon Wireless, like yeah. multi, multi, multi billion dollar companies working on um, challenging projects. But I can, you know, truth be told, building this, these venues with my partners was much more difficult and challenging than the work I had done in my consulting consulting times not because of any like self-sabotage or anything it's just like it was hard work like we had to hire 100 people before we opened up the first venue and my interview process was not easy it's not like we were hiring oh when they called you they had nobody hired no oh they had maybe they had maybe no they probably had about like 10 or 15 people okay okay they carried over from the restaurant that they had before yeah because they're toronto based first right that's right Yeah, yeah so we and it wasn't like we were hiring every second person we met, right? Like the interview process is it's hard to get through it, mm. right? So I would estimate that we were hiring like one out of every like eight people we met. Like it, it was not like just because you showed up on time for the interview, you got this is hired. Everybody. This is this is cooks, this is bartenders and waiters, dishwasher, dishwasher, dishwasher managers, like, managers to, man, security, it's, you name it. Yeah, it's it it was a wide variety of people, right? Like it wasn't just like a one system for one role. Mm -hmm. It was, it it was tough, man. It was good. We made it and I'm happy. We guys are thriving. Yeah. You know, the city likes our venues. Yeah. My partners are going, are building two more venues, um, in the coming 30 days. They're opening up two more venues in Toronto. Downtown? Downtown. Same yeah. theme, the idea. Or? Uh, one's a nightclub and one's a large scale um, uh, Chinese concept. Okay. With the Michelin star chefs. I'm not involved Michelin? in this. Michelin? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no fucking Michelin stars in Canada. I know. Get it? Like, well, he's, I don't. The he's closest the one on Spadina, they're trying to get it. What's it called? Oh, I'm there next week. Um, uh, Ava, oh, my God. Alum. Alum. That's yeah. right. I haven't That's been right. there yet. I know. I'll tell you. I'm there next week. Okay, we'll see how it goes. goes. Yeah. yeah, it's a conspiracy. They don't want to give Michelin stars to go. to Canadians. I don't know. I read some stuff. I'm like, you're telling me there's no Michelin star restaurants from coast to coast. You know what? Truth, like honestly, I don't even dig Michelin restaurants. Yeah. My okay, maybe because I'm South American. Sure. The way that I was fed yeah. as a child is as much food to the brim of the plate. Sure. Like. Three inches high, like know, a mountain. I know of you food. go to Michelle. I know, I know. I, 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 I don't appreciate the delicacy of two biters. I hear like, you. I hear I, you. I, I, it's just not for me. Yeah. Like I like a big. Like you know, I remember being fed by my dad. It's like almost like a bucket of food. Yeah. And just just <laughs> eat until you're uncomfortable. Bro, I have a I have a project, <laughs> um, a side project I want to do just for shits and giggles when I'm older. It's a restaurant, actually. It's going to make no money. I don't want it to make any money. It's called your mom's cooking. Okay. Where I ha- it's, it's like a living room where I have a retired mom that comes in and cooks her like home meals. I like that. And we just chill on the couch, on the dining table, and just eat her food. I like and that And it's, it's like 10 people, 15, 10, 10, 15, that's it, max. Tiny thing. So count, I can try just like home cooking count, a mom's food. Count me in. Yeah, man. You know who are the greatest people in the world? Some of the greatest people in the world are... Italian donuts. Yeah. They're like making the... From scratch. From scratch. Yeah. Like, you know, the next president of the U.S. should be an Italian donut. Just let her do her thing, man. Do her thing, She's managed... She's raised a bunch of kids, you know, fed them well. Yeah. Put some, you know, get some in line. Some of them are crazy. Yeah. I have some... I once dated an Italian girl and her donut was nuts. (laughs) Lovely, but nuts. So let me ask you this, man. Have you seen, has the industry changed a lot in the last like five to six years? It's trying to. Trying to, eh? It's trying to. Okay. Um, regardless of hospitality, I think every industry is now starting to see like, hmm, profits can't come first. Yeah. They are very important and they are expected every quarter. Mm-hmm. How we go about earning them needs to change a bit. Jamie Dimon, this very prominent New York-based uh, financier. I know Jamie Dimon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, he's from J.P. Morgan. J.P. Chase. Morgan CEO. He's a big dog. Yeah. Okay. Again, I'm paraphrasing, but he said companies need to operate differently now. 
you need to put your customer first, your communities first, and then figure out the profit thing. You know, in, in theory, that sounds awesome. How many, in, you know, I think Bezos and people like that also said this, like supported the message. I think companies want to change. I think industries want to change. Yeah. Especially but, banks, man. Oh, God. I have a fucking hatred towards them. I I went to the bank the other day, and um, they reached out to me to have a meeting. I guess they saw things that they liked with my account or mm-hmm. whatever. And I was like, okay, I'm going to entertain them. I grew up South American. I grew up poor. Where did you grow up? In, in Vancouver. Okay. But my parents are Peruvian. Oh, Peruvian, yeah. Um, and I was taught debt was bad, mm. right? So uh, I keep the bank within an arm's reach. And he, they sat me down. They did a song and dance. Like, you know, there's this investment opportunity or vehicle. And then I said, I asked, let him do his thing. I was humoring him. Uh, and I was like, can I speak freely? And he said, of course. I said, I don't trust you. You don't reach out to me. You see something going on with my account that you liked, and now you want to build a relationship with me. Mm-hmm. And I get why. Mm-hmm. You, have to, you have to pay your numbers. There's commission base to make too, yeah. I'm sure. But I was like, the th- reason that I don't trust you is because what if something bad happened to me? What if I lost all my money tomorrow and couldn't make my minimum payments? The relationship would change. You wouldn't be doing this song and dance right now. Yeah. I was like, that's why I don't trust you. And I, I was like, I, I'm not saying this to you, the individual, Brad. Mm-hmm. I just mean your industry. Mm-hmm. So that's why I don't want to have a relationship on your terms. How did he, th- how did he uh, respond to that? Uh, man, you could just tell. <laughs> you could, I could see him like he froze. Yeah. And you could almost like visually see him be like how like what did they teach me in training how do i like, rebuttal this right this now? exactly <laughs> I, I can't can't compute. Compute. Yeah. yeah exactly um but back to the industry part the my the hospitality industry does want to change right yeah. like you do have some some forward uh, some leaders of the industry like danny myers of shake shack and the union square hospitality but you have to think not too long ago Gordon Ramsay was a celebrated individual in the industry. And what was he known for? He was known for being an asshole, like yelling at people till you, to get the best out of them. Like, give me a break, man. That's not the way that you lead people. I like to be benevolent and I like to be a servant leader. And look, like I, I lead with kindness, but if you're not hitting your numbers, Week after week, month mm-hmm. after month. Okay, the conversation is going to be a little different. I'm not going to be so friendly. I'm mm-hmm. not ever going to belittle you or berate you to make you feel small. But, you know, a different side will come out to me. Who's responsible? Like, uh, if people are wondering within the uh, industry. So you have, uh, would it be managers responsible for their certain team to hit numbers? Or, like, how, who's, 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 who's really the lead for It's a collective that? effort. Yeah. Um, ultimately, the GM is responsible okay. for hitting the numbers. So for example, let's say... And numbers would be top line revenue. Top line and bottom line. Yeah. Right? You got to manage those controllables and your expen- your fixed and variable expenses. Um, but let's say it's Thursday mm. and we're trending toward not hitting our revenue numbers for the week. Well, the GM's got to pick up on that and be like, hey guys, you need to be sl- <laughs> you need to be slanging b- double vodka sodas for the next <laughs> seventy two yeah, yeah. hours to yeah. hit those numbers. Yeah. Uh, or uh, you know managing our our cogs, managing our suppliers, and how much we're spending with them. Because mm-hmm. um, it's a body count game. The more bodies you come in there, you would think. You would think. You huh? would think. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a little nightclub on the second floor of, of our flagship venue. Yeah, I checked it out last time. Escobar. Yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah. when we are close to capacity, we don't sell as much as if we are have more space in the room. Okay. Because if you think about it, if you're shoulder to shoulder, yeah, it's harder to make your way to the bar. This is true. Right? So there's not enough space to be able to move freely uh, around the room. Yeah. If you're shoulder to shoulder, that's not a good vibe. You're going to leave. Yeah, right? it's not a good. Then, yeah, yeah. It's right? like too crowded, man. Exactly. Yeah. And then you order your drink and then you finish and you're like, oh, yeah. now i got to wait another 20 minutes. So I hated it, that whole fucking dance. I, look, I, 
I hate nightclubs. Yeah. And yeah, I, <laughs> uh, catch I, 20. Here's a catch 22. I know. Well, <laughs> maybe that's what that, that's, I mean, if you hate nightclubs or you hate it, you just look at it as like, okay, how do I optimize this and make it the best experience? That's exactly, that's yeah. exactly what I'm trying to do at least. Right. Like I'm, you know, I was telling you before we jumped on this podcast, like me and my girlfriend celebrated going to bed at eight 30 last night. Right. That's a measure of success yeah, for me. Fuck yeah. I'm not, I'm not um, extraordinarily social. Like I like to socialize before 9 p.m. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thankful I have a partner named Maddie who uh, takes care of that part of the business and he does such an amazing job. I could not do what he does. He just went through, f I think, 14 straight days of going out and entertaining people because of TIFF. Oh my God. I yeah, went out for right, three tiff, straight yeah, days yeah. and immediately got sick. And he, he laughed at me. He's like, well, you're not cut out for this yeah. industry. I'm like, not that part of yeah, it. Man. Yeah. But he does a fantastic job. He's, you know, he's, I call it politicking. He's really good at shaking hands, kissing babies. Mm -hmm. um, and we, as, as a group, we all come together uh, exceptionally because we each have our role mm -hmm. and we, we, you know, stay in our lanes and do good work. And, um, I, uh, I, I like the work that we've done. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of us. And are you, uh, are you going to be continuing with them on these other projects or? I'm not. Okay. I'm not. Um, cause I know you're focusing a lot on this right now. I see. Yeah. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm traveling like, a lot, man. A I see lot, that. Man. Yeah. I'll probably hit, I'll probably hit 150 or more 150,000 kilometers in the air this year. Um, which isn't like a, a badge of honor by any mm -hmm. means, but you know, if, if the check's big enough, I'll go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm up to something else. Okay. Incognito for now. And then come a little yeah. bit, a little yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'll be prepared to announce the next month. Oh yeah. Good. Soon. Good. I would love to tell you right now, man, but my girlfriend's uh, not my, my girlfriend's always like, you're the worst at keeping your own secrets. If you told me something, I'll take it to my grave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my own, uh, own secrets. I'm a little child. I can't keep his mouth shut. Sure. Um, it, it's still in the food space. Okay. Um, it, it has to do with proven food. Okay. I'll leave it at that. I'll nice. come back on this podcast and announce what's going on. But very cool. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, if you thought what I did with my partners in hospitality was challenging, probably say this will be a, a, even more challenging than that. I'm excited for that. I'm excited too, man. I, my partners and I have done great work, and they're gonna crush it in this city. Mm. I, I know what they're up to, and I'm I'm super proud and super jacked up for them. Um, and you know, I'm kind of just going on a different path and, and you're still going to be, uh, you're going to still be connected with, uh, with them currently or, uh, we're figuring that out. Okay. Yeah. We're figuring that out. Um, I'm always going to be, you know, before I was their business partner, I was their friend. Right. And that matters to me. Of course. Um, you know, if I moved out of the country and they called me and said, Hey, we're having a little trouble with our customer experience i'd be on a flight right away mm -hmm. to support them right because they're my friends before they were my business partners i'll never forget that mm -hmm. i'll never forget that they gave me an opportunity to come to the city and do this work i met my girlfriend who you know all signs point to we're going to be getting married one day because i moved to this city right so th that kind of goes to the way that i operate as well too it's kind of like a handshake agreement yeah, like man. I, I i made yeah. i made you guys a promise right um, and, and that's, there's no expiration on that. Um, and I think that aligns with just having integrity, right? Man, you know, it's sometimes you're like, damn it. I did say that. Can't go against my word. Right. Um, Even like owning up to fucking faults. I seem like people are playing such victimhood fucking cards these days. You think so? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe they've been babysit too much or like they're pointing like, fingers. Julie, you know, that's why I like one Julie of my fifth, fifth. Place. place trophies and what, you know I, I, I like what uh, Jocko Wilkin uh, ha, you know his book Extreme Ownership it's like common sense man it's like own it like yo we f I fucked up yeah I'm here to fix it I'm like fuck okay you know what's <laughs> for me what would be more awkward than having that tough conversation is letting yourself go a couple months and living with that mm. on your conscience but you know what the fucked up thing is mm -hmm. some people can just like it didn't happen yeah, that's are, narcissism. Sociopaths. Sociopaths, pardon me. That's a sociopath. Doesn't even register. No, I know. Like sometimes I'm almost like, I wish I had a little bit of that because I th things really sit with me. 
Yeah. And I'm like, oh, and it weighs on my conscience. And, you know, sometimes I was like, I wish I just didn't give a fuck. <laughs> But I do. It's complicated, man. It's like the genes you have, man, how you're it, raised, where you're raised, when you're raised. 100%. Like, all these variables, 100%, you know? 100%, man. Like for a sociopath, you would view it at like, okay, say you're outside and you're viewing it from like a, pass or a passenger, right? You're watching like an opera. And from like your own morals and ethics, you'd be like, oh, that person's doing bad. I always tell people... You really believe people wake up in the morning and said, I'm going to do bad evil yeah. like, No. No one believes they're fucking bad or evil. Everyone believes they're good. Everybody. Right. This side, that side. Everybody is doing good. Uh, so you can't like fault people for their like default behavior. It's just a fact. That's it. Just take it at, take it as face value. Keep them with Don't digest it anymore. Don't kind yeah. of like stare at it with a fucking magnifying glass. Like it is what it is, man. That's the information you have and just deal with it. Yeah. You know, people try to make like too much of certain situations. It's like, no, I hear you. I you actually I mean? feel that. It's like uh, one of my favorite thinkers is, uh, or was Krishnamurti. Who's that? Oh, yeah. Interesting story. Google Krishnamurti afterwards. Okay. Like, eh. I'm going to go down the very Wikipedia sim route. Very both. similar to like Jungian psychology, uh, you know, similar to like Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, lots of similar to like Joseph Campbell, even like modern day stuff, like what Jordan Peterson talks about. It's mm -hmm. like, at the end, like he has a, he has, he has a very interesting uh, comment. Somebody asked him in the crowd is like, well, what do you think about homosexuality? He's like, what am I supposed to think? What's there to even think about? It's like, okay. It's something. It's a, yeah. it, there's nothing to think. Right. It's like same thing with heterosexuality. What is there to think about? What am I thinking? This is just, you're doing what you're doing. There's no, there's no digging into it. There's no like, oh, well, I'm going to put a label. It is what it is. That's, that's what it is. Right. You know, people try to label things too much. Like everything's a label. I hear you. You know, it's like, oh, you're this. I'm like, really? That's it? Like, <laughs> I'm that? You know, like, fuck, man. There's a good Vedic saying, if you label me, you negate me. Because as soon as you label me, you put me in this like, dimensional box. I like that. You're right. It's like, I'm only this box. Right. Like, I'm only this and nothing else. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? So get the fuck out of here. That's interesting. You know, when I started this, by the way, you're the third guest All right. on this, you know, the new Amir Proof show. It, yeah, that's right, brother. You're like, oh, you're going to do just crypto. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. You want any crypto? You think that's all I care about? Right. Like, I'll do whatever the hell I want to do, whenever I want to do it, how I want to do it. I think people, like, have a... <sighs> There's two things with labels. I know we're going off subject here, but... Labels give people empowerment and it's because people respect labels. They don't respect people. Like when you go to, um, when you go to court and you're looking at the magistrate or the judge, you're not respecting the person, respecting the, 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 the judge, judge, the crown, the, the label. Yeah. That's the myth, not the Kinda person, like, you know, like Michelle Falcon Esquire. You care about the Esquire part. All right. Or doctor. Who are you respecting? You're respecting the title doctor. Or all people say, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, that's your identity only? I'm a fucking entrepreneur. I'm like, you know, or like uh, one of my old school friends, like he's like really old, he's like 75. He's like, that's all we had. We, that's our only option we had back in the day. Mm -hmm. What's this fucking entrepreneur thing? Like, if I didn't work for myself, you know what I'd have? Nothing on the table. Right. This, this, this concept of entrepreneur is like brand new. And it's yeah. like do or die back in the day. It's like, if I didn't, you know, have my farm and do blacksmithing and all this shit, like, I'm just dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? Survival, right? So it's fascinating, man. Very fascinating. I'm going to ask you this question. After writing this, yep. you know, after writing this, what would you say is your biggest takeaway? Because it's one thing to have information in your head, work with somebody, dump it. It's second, once you actually see it, read it, and then be like, oh shit, I didn't really really realize that. Like, did you take any did you get any takeaways after writing this? Um, yeah, human behavior is is, is funny. Um you can say that a million times. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> it's unpredictable. <laughs> it's like uh people will read the book, send me emails, tweets, whatever, say I really, really liked it, I really liked this section. And I make note of people that okay. reach out to me. 
And then I'll mark my calendar and say, I'm going to follow up with them in three months. Mm. And then when that three months comes, my Gmail reminds me. Um, I'll follow up and say, hey, how's it, how's it going? Did you change your interview process yet? No, not yet. Not yet. Yeah. What's up? Why? Oh, it's just, you know, it's whatever. Sure. The reasons are, are endless. Um, and... This is why you can never change human behavior. It's almost That's why consulting is weird to me. It's like <clears throat> advisory. Mm -hmm. Like consulting is actually the way that I def uh, define the two is, and I used to do a lot more consulting than I do today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do nearly zero advisory, but consulting is like, we're going to do it for you. Advisory is like, I'm going to coach you on how to yes. do it. Right. Um, with consulting, you know, it's quite labor intensive. The advisory, um, I can tell them what to do until I'm blue in the face, but ultimately it's them that have to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I've, I have found it interesting that people want to change, but for one reason or another, they don't. Um, they, they're like, Michelle, this book really resonates with me. This is the way I want to operate. This is the way that I want to lead my team. But then they also they always default to what they were doing for the past. It's, three it's something years. called a hedonic treadmill. What's it called? Hedonic treadmill. Hedonic treadmill. Hamster wheel. Okay. Of happiness. Oh, Why don't you say that then? <laughs> <laughs> There's your lesson I get, number I day. get that. <laughs> uh, didn't graduate university. Bro, I didn't, uh, didn't graduate uh, fucking high school. You didn't. I got kicked out on great night, brother. I guess I get the fuck out of here. Nice. Yeah, man. I can't stand school. I hated it every second of it. I barely passed elementary school. They said I was I had ADD, almost put me on Ritalin. Thank God my mom like had a common sense. I'm not putting my fucking kid on Ritalin. Is Ritalin the one that helps you concentrate? Yeah. Yeah. Like Adderall type of deal. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. There's one company I advise, um, and it's the only company I retained. So I used to do a lot of advisory before 2016 when I moved to Toronto. But there's one that I've retained, and it's a dental practice okay. in Oshawa. And in Oshawa? In Oshawa. Okay. Right? A six, seven million dollar yeah. business. And the reason I kept them was because if I thought hospitality was hard, yeah. dentistry is even harder. Oh, God. And it's almost like I like cutting myself. Sure. Like, like the challenge. Yeah. yeah. It's oh, masochist. Man. What is it? Yeah, no, exactly. Ah, yeah. Yeah. Put the apple in my mouth, punch yeah. it in the face. Um, but uh, so I advise them, but they genuinely want to change. So when I, you know, give them some advice, and yes, share feedback on what they should do, I help them come to their own answers. Um, but then they execute it. And yeah. for me, that's so rewarding and fulfilling. Um, but that's a rare breed, man. To hear something execute it, rare. it is. It really is. Look at the Tony Robbins crowd. Everyone goes, "Yay, Tony!" Yeah, I'm like, but then they don't do anything after. Shit. It's a but dopamine look, high, man. It's like heroin. It is. It's like, oh, yeah, I motivation. Went, uh, look, I went to a Tony Robbins yeah. event. I think when I was nineteen. Yeah, it was like I went to like a rave and did a bunch of ecstasy. Exactly, it was insane. It's a cult, man. It's like, yeah, it really is. I was on a high for like. Six hours and then it dissipated and sure. then it went back yeah. to tried and true nineteen year old weed smoking me yeah. just wanted to hit his bong. Yeah. So it, it is interesting like how some people will take that information, run with it and create change and other people are just left with it's an expense and ninety five. I was saying ninety nine yeah, percent left I, I that was way. I was just gonna ask, I would be curious to know what those numbers are. Uh, I'm reading a really good book right now, and the name of the author is escaping me, but it's called the title of the book's quite simple. It's grit. G R I T. Okay. I like that word. I do, too. And um, sh the, I was listening to a podcast, uh, Emily Weiss, the founder of Glossier. Mm -hmm. I think I'm saying that properly, the makeup company. And she had, was on How I Built This and said it was a book that she really liked. So I read it and. Essentially, it dives deep in the psychology of why people get things done and mm -hmm. others just give up. And I know that topic might sound super general, but like the author really uses you know science that is believable and and easy to understand in layman's terms. Um, I'm halfway through and I really like it. And I'm looking forward to finishing the other half. I buy a lot of books. I read very few. I have a lot of books in my office. 
Uh, but Grit's one that I intend on finishing. I do um, Audible a lot. And then uh, I'll find out that author has been on a podcast. Uh-huh. And then listen to that. Okay. Um, so you won't finish the Audible? Depends, man. I'm, okay. I'm, I, I take it to a pro... Uh, so a lot of my reading or my behavior to reading. So you said earlier today, people absorb information differently. So mm-hmm. if you look at like neuro-linguistic programming, you have people who are very, uh, like I'm autodidactic. I learn by myself. I can't learn through a teacher. I won't okay. sit down, right? I have to absorb st- stuff by myself. But for me, I'm more very, I'm very tactile. I have to write it down. Like when I read a book, I'll rip out pages. I'll, I'll circle things around. And so there's a, there's a really good book I recommend to people called How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler, printed in 1934. Okay meta analysis of understanding the art of reading, right? And um, people view reading as transactional, meaning it's like, okay, I have to read every word. It's not, it's a relationship. Do right. what you want with the book. You wanna, you wanna start in the middle of the book? Sure, I wanna rip out one page. If I just wanna start, let's fucking study chapter 11, first page here of economics, that's all I'm gonna study. Got it. So it's more of a like, what's your relationship to this book? So how it starts is like, Okay, you got Michelle here. Who's fucking Michelle? Why the fuck did Michelle spend his whole time sure. writing this? That's more important than the actual book, mm-hmm. right? So then you have to understand his point of view. You know, he spent all this time, years of experience, now trying to digest it. So you have to understand, okay, how's, where is he coming through the, uh, at this? Uh, next thing you go, you can go like table of contents. It's like, okay, how do you think? How's this book designed? You know, where do I want to start? I, maybe some things I don't care about. Like right. first thing that jumped into me was a hiring thing. Got it. Because I'm always hiring. I'm like, I don't oh. give a shit about anything. Yeah. You know, where is Just it? Where, you know, where, where is it? Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like hiring. You know what I mean? Like, that's Got what it. I care about, right? So I view, I view like that. And I think, um, yeah, just combination. Like, uh, I really recommend how to read a book. And then, like, I, I, I'll, sometimes I'll have the book of the author, the audible, and podcasts. Going at the same time? Yeah. Oh my god! Different sections. So that I'm reading awful. it. That sounds awful to me. For me, I absorb it because for me, it's not about like people like oh, I read like ten books. I'm like, oh, fuck, I care about right. just reading. Like, you so. know what? Thing speaking of that, yeah. <clears throat> there's some people online that are like, I read a book a day, or there's uh, like this statistic I saw on Twitter, like the top CEOs in America read sixty books a year. Yeah, right. Like what? Like really? Like defined who? reading. Yeah, who's believing this stuff? Also, it's like any, okay, so Do you, you know somebody that reads 60 books a year? No. Um, no, I don't think so. I don't um, think so either. I related to AI. So people are like, wow, we got this AI and all this stuff, right? And the re- reason I'm relating it to AI and reading like 64 books is like, okay, we got all this data in the fucking cloud over there. We don't know, we don't know what the data is about. We don't know shit. It's just data sitting in the cloud, right? Same thing like, reading 64 books like so what it's random data i have what am i doing with this fucking data yeah oh cool or it's well, so what it's more imp- it's like good, yeah. it's like what's one what action mean. item it's like oh like for example this the hiring that's an action item yeah, i can fucking do point. data it, that i can use and and that's a good point because when, before i started reading the grit book that kind of it, it was shortly before i heard the recommendation to read that book I was like, I, I want to increase my perseverance. Um, and, and then serendipitously, I listened to that podcast. Mm. And she's, you know, I respect the person who recommended it. Um, and this book seems like it's right up my alley. So there was a desired outcome. I was, that was the education that I was seeking. Whereas if you're like, I'm just going to read 60 books. I'm like, whoa, man, like what path are you going? Like, why? Yeah. Is it for the knowledge? Yeah. Okay. But what do you do? What do you, are you going to do anything with knowledge? Knowledge is overrated. Knowledge. I, I know a lot of knowledgeable people. They're fucking dumb. <laughs> knowledgeable. Was, dumb. Was, the other day I was in a room with nine people and I, uh, this entrepreneur was like, you put a thousand people in the room, in a room, one person's smart. And I like look around. I'm like, yo man, you're in a room of nine people. Which one of us is the dumb one? Or are we all dumb? Yeah. Yeah. And he's like, Oh, I didn't mean it that way. I'm like, well, how did you mean it? Then? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's that crazy. Reminded me of that. But yeah. So let me ask you this. If you had to give one message to people, what would that be? Care, put yourself last. Um, I know that if I am honest 
about the relationships that I build with anybody um, in my personal life or in my professional life, good things will come to me. Mm. Uh, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not saying that to be kumbaya-like. I just know that if, if even if something bad did happen, a supplier screwed me over, yeah. an investor screwed me over, my girlfriend cheated on me. At least I know that I did well. And, you know, I'm not the type to think short term either. Like I'm not I'm not on this podcast today because I'm like, what am I gonna get from it? I just wanna have a conversation with you, man, get to know you a little bit more. Maybe one day we work together or something happens, mm -hmm. right? Um and I take that same mentality with everybody I meet, whether that's somebody I've been friends with for twenty years or like that woman who I offered my condo to, who I'd known for less than two minutes. See what happens, man. So far, so good, right? Like I, I, I think I'm likable. I think people enjoy my company. I, I think I'm building a cool career. I think I'm a good son, a good brother, a good boyfriend, a good father to my dog, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And just see what happens, man. Like, People have to stop being so selfish. Um, and just, you know, every action that you make, every decision you make, every action you take, everything you say, just think of putting yourself second. Um, and I'm I'm no angel, man. I'm not perfect. Uh, I, I sometimes make mistakes. and We're human, bro. 100%. Fuck. There's things that I'm like, I, you know, there's things that I'll walk back and apologize for, but... It's a human condition. Yeah. That's why I say people take things too... They take they take everything too personal. And they, 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 they sticks with them, you know, stays with them. And they're like, oh, you know, Michelle, he didn't reply to my email. Half and I'm yeah. like, so what? Maybe he's fucking busy. I don't fucking know. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? But I've had people, like, they tell me, it's like, why didn't he reply? I'm like... There's a million fucking reasons yeah. why he didn't reply. 100%. Yeah, I mean, don't take it personal. Like, You know, with that note, though, I always try to think, and I, I know this might sound cliche, being like, if somebody did that to me, would that piss me off? So somebody the other day asked me to, um, if I was interested in coming to their conference. And they'd been asking me for a couple of years. And I was not going to respond to the mm -hmm. email because I wasn't interested. But then I was like, you know, wait, wait a second. If I was him and I didn't get a response, I'd be upset by that person. How long does it take just to send an email saying, hey, man, I'm actually not interested in this uh, for this reason? That's it, right? So, like, you know, there, uh, that's just being honest and having clarity. Mm -hmm. um, and having that, you know, difficult conversation by sending that email i was like yeah, i feel kind of bad sending this email but that's yeah. how i'm feeling the fastest way for humans to get happiness to remove expectation well said yeah i'm a, some buddhist saying <laughs> yeah, well, yeah it's, it's expect so that person has expectations exactly right you do something you have an expectation right uh you have high expectations from your team like fucking high and they don't hit it you're like right but it's still an expectation that you set in your own psyche you remove that expectation it's like just you can i take i, I want to earlier you asked me what's a key message i can yeah. share for people there's a, another thing that came to mind people don't fail processes do mm. and this is specifically to business uh, i try to draw a line between my personal life and my professional mm -hmm. life at times um but it can be relatable to both so people don't feel processes do. Um, Amir, if you were someone on my team, let's say you were a bartender, and you weren't quote-unquote getting it, you weren't making drinks fast enough, mm -hmm. or whatever the case might be, is Amir failing? Or maybe our learning and development program failed Amir. Maybe we didn't teach him how to make these cocktails mm. well enough. If I can honestly say, you know what? No, we have a great training program. Yeah. The next question I'm going to ask is, what about our interview process? Maybe our interview process failed our business. How did Amir get hired? How did he pass the skill set yeah. interview? Um, and then, you know, for me as related uh, to my personal life, if I'm not 
a good boyfriend to Sophia, am I failing or is our process of our relationship failing? Do we have, do we not have enough time to spend together? And the little time that we do have, we're arguing because we don't have enough time to build that relationship, right? So that's what I like to do is not just to immediately point the finger and say you're failing. It's like maybe the environment that they're in is failing them and that that person is actually bright or should be within the business or yeah. in your personal life. So people don't fail processes do. I love it. We'll leave it at that. So if people want to get in touch, get the book, best resource. My parents blessed and cursed me with this unique name. So I I thought it was Michael for a time. It must be French or something does. like that. Everyone. Then Jason's so, like, no, so, it's Michelle. Yeah. 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 So this is, so this is it. It's like Michael, but without the A. So it is Michelle. My middle name is Alexander. Mm -hmm. My parents were going to name me either Michelle or Eric. They chose Michelle. So I missed out on a normal name two times. Forget um, the normal names. Yeah. <laughs> so if you want, just go to Google, type in my first and last name. Okay. You can find me on social media there. You can find the book. You can find a whole bunch of stuff. Also, guys listening, this will be in the show notes. I have links to Michelle's book on Amazon, his website, and everything. Yeah. Throw my email address up there if anybody wants to say what up. Cool. We'll do that, Michelle. All right, Thanks, brother. Thank, on, you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.